the contact with the pathway. There's a whole range of different scenarios. We've got um, one of the descendants of Dr. Monkton, who lived at the end of Campbell Street here in the building, and who had acreage that looked over and lost now to Rome Park. And his descendant has given all his diaries to National Archives, which is where they should be, and wanting to pin down some photographs. And I've got this photograph, it's in the album. Um, my mother never really knew where it was. Can you help us? So we get people rushing in, young ones, which is good, might be catching the young ones, get them on board to independent things. I've just bought this house, and uh, I'm wanting to know where are the photographs, please, of the, when it was first built and the people who first lived in it standing on the veranda. <laughs> we do a lot of liaison with that type of question, we're well, quite central because down two, two, two buildings down the way, which is the regional um, council's archive, which holds all the council records, but they do put a lot of building consents and uh, information for some of the social histories, so they're, they're liaised really well. And as well with that, we liaise with all the uh, other wonderful archives in the area. Um, I was just chatting um, over a drink on Friday afternoon, late afternoon, at the Johnsonville um, Bowling Club, and the, one of the um, people there said, oh, my wife was very heavily involved with the fielding, fielding roller skates, and uh, they've now folded, and where can I put my records? It's an easy answer. So we're getting more and more uh, people like now we have established and people like <coughs> we are, are offering their precious records, like that box of the time of it. You'd be amazed at what's on the people's beds. Yeah. Oh, that's really yeah. Good. And what about, um, so it's good to hear that some young people are coming in, because that was one of my questions was, you know, um, like who is coming in and who is accessing, um, and so it is, it's heartening to know that it's, um, you know, that it's, because it's often people later in life, aren't they, that, that, that go down that pathway of um, discovering, you know, history, personal history, or as you say, the history of their house or whatever, so it's nice to know that some young people are coming through the doors. It's been out here in Portland, very Yeah. Um, and what about some of that magic? You know, that um, often when you when you when you go through, like when I was going through my box in front of me, you know, with the type of the um, majestic cinema, the things that I was attracted to were the were the funny little you know notes in the corner of the you know the Passover of staff of letting the next person know. It's extended, you obviously couldn't send a text message or an email. It was that you know little handwritten note of. Um, of passing on what's happened and so and so, you know, did this and da 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 da. Um, those were the interesting things for me, were the li little anecdotal, um, you know, things that I found. Um, and they can often, you know, it's either the connectors, aren't they? The person with connectors, it sort of humanizes the history. Um, so, what little, is it, some little gems that have, you know, popped up for you over the years that you, you remember? Well, uh, just this year for the um, Journal of History, um, uh, another house sale that went on on West Street, and the um, owner, new owner, said he found underneath the floorboards these dusty diaries. And the previous owner had been Pat Mason, and those of you who know this area, the Frank Mason Rose um, Nursery, uh, Sandon Road, and this is social history. Is Frank Mason um, was a descendant of um, Quaker Mason, who um, in my first in my first house in Titer, um, we had this lovely expensive park that we used to do and we'd push the children down to play on, and that had been established for the Avalon Film Studios is, and that had been Quaker Mason's garden back in the 1840s when he first settled. Um, and so here's a descendant of his, Frank Mason, who, by the way, um, was one of the first to start growing um, kiwi fruit when they were 
the Chinese gooseberries. And he got the seed from this uh, sister of this missionary who had come back from China and brought some seeds with her. Hayward. It was the Hayward was the name. It was uh, the Hayward variety of kiwi fruit that we're still familiar with. So there's all these you know, in interconnected uh, things. Anyway, going <coughs> back to Frank Mason. So his son, James, married Pat, who was a florist. And back in the 40s uh, and the 50s, a florist was really dependent on having a nursery. You couldn't just know internet, you couldn't get on the blower and say, I'm wanting uh, a dozen uh, red roses or I'm wanting orchids in a shade of um, pale pink. And so you were very reliant as a um, florist to have a nice source of fruit. And here she was, she married um, James, who was a daily expert. and and belonged to Frank Mason up the hill um, with all this uh, wonderful greenery and tunnel houses and access to <coughs> heaps of good um, greenery to do flowers. But she found her business diaries, or someone found them under the house. Right? Yes. And these, if I can just step in for a moment, uh, this is a, a reproduction of a page from the business diaries. Uh, and you can see there's a wedding order there. In fact, there's two wedding orders, but one of them has swatches of material uh, stapled onto the page of the business diary to show what the bride was wearing, what the bridesmaids, so that the flower colours would match. And um, Pat Mason was uh, a bit of an expert in making these matches. I know this is a bit far away for you to see, but you can come up later and have a better look. But you can see in the colour photo at the bottom of the page that I opened there, um, our local Palmerston North wedding, the Belk Tenant wedding, and uh, you can, I think, see how the frangipani there have been chosen, so it's by Pat Mason, so as to uh, suit, suit the fabrics of the, the bridesmaids and brides dresses. Anyway, uh, you can have a whole into the place of what you can And as well as Pat Mason's diaries, uh, which were a bit dusty by the way, which I'm probably concerned, um, there's her father in laws Frank Mason, his business diaries, and then there's his mother's diaries as well, and talking about um, the children all uh, saddled up the horses and we went for a ride for tea. And that's uh, early 1900s. We're very grateful to people like the Masons who bought all their diaries into the market. Um, or maybe I've broadened it out and, and, and you've really asked me to tell me some little um, snippets of some magic. One thing that just popped into my brain when I was um, doing the Thai Happy Project was um, that they, back in the day they used to ride their horses to the cinema and um, they would bring their saddles inside and have them with them but they'd often like be quite flea ridden <laughs> so there'd be a bit of space around you know these old dudes with their, with their saddles beside them. Um, so yeah maybe just open it out and, and, and have a little nasher about some, some gems that have kind of transpired that, you, that have stuck in your brain because it's funny the little little stories that, that stay with you. Um. Yes, I, I mean, the point is you're coming across them all the time. I think we work with the archives who are um, constantly in and out of uh, boxes for other people's inquiries, but that actually informs you um, often about the detail of what you have. We all know the collections we have, we haven't always been into every box and, um, and examined those. So I think that's why um, I think we all love our jobs, is that we are constantly learning ourselves and finding out about things as well. And um, I'm just kind of thinking, so, so there really is magic in every box. And, and sometimes I think, because we have council and community archives as well, <coughs> um, I, you often think the council records are a bit drier, and, and perhaps they are a little bit, but there's still an awful lot of interest um, within those records as well as to how something has developed and the conversations that went on or the demands that were made so that these facilities or um, developments around the city actually happened. I mean, um, Val's in the audience and Val wrote her book on um, the swimming pools. And so she spent an awful lot with council archives. So, so that was an instance where uh, 
her, her book has really far more influenced by development records, council records, than it was by those community ones, which of course filled out the story as well. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking of some of the things that are wonderful within our, and, and I, I could go on and on, so I'll try to limit myself. But um, sometimes we go right back in time and think about our oldest records and what we have there. Um, and we have some fantastic uh, old records, historical ones. For example, we have records from the Monrad family. Um, the Monrad family were from Scandinavia, <coughs> which Russell won't I'm sure know all about, not quite a high family, but still. Um, <laughs> um, he, was, uh, he was a Prime Minister in Denmark at the time and sort of got himself into a bit of a scrap by not winning a war and, and sort of um, being in disrepute at the time. So where else would you go but New Zealand in the 1860s? Uh, so he brought him to <coughs> family over here. Um, and, and there's a bit of names, uh, naming around past and what's but next to the family. And they settled in Kariri because this was really before the township of Palmerston North um, existed. And, um, and so we have some lovely records of theirs. They're, they're sketchy, they're what have remained. Um, and they have been augmented um, sometimes by other family members as well. But for example, we have a lovely diary written by Olga Mon Monrad, who was Bishop Monrad's daughter-in-law. And they stayed in New Zealand, unfortunately, when Olga um, died young. And uh, so it's, it's her diary written in Danish, and we do fortunately have translation, but none of us are fluent in Danish. And, um, and, and it's, it's just a very everyday diary about what you were doing and you were preserving fruit or you're out in the garden or Mr and Mrs so-and-so called in. It's very everyday things, but it gives you a real picture, albeit it's not in huge detail of, of the sort of life they were living. It, it doesn't make it sound hard. We look back and think, gosh, that must have been an incredibly <coughs> hard life. But um, she doesn't make it sound hard, it's just what you do um, in any circumstance, or they go to Wanganui, which of course is a long trip for them. So um, that's, that is a wonderful example of an older archive. Another one is Louisa Snelson's um, scrapbook. Louisa was uh, the Marys, the first Marys of Palmerston North, when, um, when George Snelson became the mayor in 1877. And Louisa's scrapbook, and it's the only thing we have of the Snelsons, unfortunately, because uh, George Snelson came very early on, slightly before Louisa, and uh, set up the first shop on the square uh, of what was to become, obviously, the centre of And uh, unfortunately, they, they did have children, but they all died very young. So Louisa was very involved with community affairs. And this scrapbook reflects that. It's just the scrapbook. It's just the, the way, um, you know, she kept her memories uh, throughout those years before, nine, mainly, well before 1900, probably the 80s and 90s more. And she, uh, you know, there's, there's newspaper clippings of things that George and her went to, there's invitations, there's dance cards, um, you know, of, of going to a dance and people would put their name down for the first or third or ninth dance. Um, there is, uh, I, I think one of the lovely things is, it's just cuttings out of magazines that, um, that of course were all English in those days, and it would be a photo of a, a, a drawing more of a hat. Um, and plainly it was something she either aspired to have or perhaps did find somebody that could make that hat for her. Or well, it was fashion photographs. Um, and, and there's also photographs of, uh, actually photographs of, of local people. So that's a wonderful reflection of what interested a, a woman um, at that time. And she was an extremely busy woman. She was very, as I say, community focused and um, was fully involved um, in getting some of the services uh, in Palmerston North, particularly, uh, for example, the hospital. So it wasn't like she was just sitting trying to find things to do. Um, but I do think that this is a lovely example. Um, but in lockdown, of course, when I was at home, I also got the chance to really get stuck in and do some processing. And I, I think sometimes we forget about 
um, as Marilyn said, about you know the importance of, of collecting out. While nobody's perhaps necessarily studying some of our very recent records because they're in people's living memories, they are our future um, records as well. So they're going to be there forever. And it's very important that we are collecting agencies to ensure these maintained. And, and a couple of interesting ones that I did was um, I did the Pit Park people, um, which is a relatively new organisation, if you know the Pit Park in Palmerston North. And, uh, and they've given us their, their records. And so while they're an ongoing organisation, of course, it's all around what, how they developed, um, the conversations they had with council, um, what was their purpose. Um, you can see this very small core of people who do most of the work, really, and, and actually ensure that everything happens. So um, I think that's um, got a huge amount of, amount of value where it, it was completely community driven, um, but in, required that council support to ensure that everything happened. And another one I did, which I found really fascinating, was the Coalition Against the Tour um, group, which only existed for just over a year. And um, and it's just their papers, and, and of course, they had a huge interactions with other groups like Hanat, which, um, if you're of a certain age, we know all these names um, about um, protesting about the spring books, um, and the politics of rugby playing in South Africa. And that's a really fascinating little snippet of a slice of life of Palmerston North at the time and how people gathered together for a very specific purpose. Um, and then, and then it, I guess it died away and some of those people may have gone on to other interests as well. So, um, you know, it, you could go on forever, and I'm sure Marilyn um, could as well, that, um, every time we find something. But uh, yeah, I, I, if there was one thing I said, uh, I, I would want to say is that it's yeah. really important to be proactively uh, collecting new records as well because they are going to be the gems of tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to set us up on another Sorry. tangent and I'm just going to like ditch the, the original plan because you just touched on something that I, that I wanted um, to, do, to bring out in the discussion and that was, you know, in this age of social media and the internet and um, you know the, the way that we now communicate um, and you know and trying to get down the, the histories that we're living now um, you know the, the life that we live in now um, uh, you know how how do you see that um, you know transpiring in the future of um, there's not going to be dusty old boxes necessarily there'll be dusty old hard drives or something you know the future looks different doesn't it in, in our future history um, and how do we um, you know work with uh, the way that we process information now um, how do you see that happening in the future I guess I'm asking that to everybody as well. It's digital media is yeah. a minefield really because how many of us have still got videos that are and have still got the video <laughs> so that's the ongoing Yes, I mean, it's a huge challenge um, with, with the archives because, one, we're not going to get those, those same intimate um, pieces of information like diaries and correspondence. I mean, you know, it, I, I suspect there won't be many hands raising if I said who's written a letter even in the last year, um, an actual letter as opposed to perhaps a or something. So it's, um, I, I think we're going to have to be a lot more creative about how we do ensure that we actually get information. Um, you know, children don't handwrite in the same way, um, and what goes onto a computer is much more vulnerable than those precious things that mothers kept because they, you know, they were memories of what their children um, perhaps did or what, what they did themselves. Um, you know, I've still got letters between my mother and father, you know, in the 1940s, you know, when they were apart in their 50s um, at times. And, um, you know, what couples write letters to each other these days, they'd just be on the phone. They would be in constant touch. So there's no need for those things. And um, I, I don't know that any archive has particularly um, knows exactly how they're going to manage getting those memories. I, I think we're okay for more organisations and uh, 
you know, even council, like for us, council archives, because they are going to be electronic records and um, because we're a large organisation, we can back those up. I think it's those the personal um, records that we won't be getting in the same way and we have to think about how we do capture those memories. I know during lockdown I've got um, three kids, um, school age kids, and um, they were encouraged to write diaries, which I, th I thought was a really cool thing. Um, so I guess it's, you know, that was through, uh, you know, a different sort of a time, but if we could encourage that to happen, you know, more in their, in their school, I mean, that they're, you know, they're writing down the everyday, but everyday things are, uh, are history and, and are interesting. Um, so, um, Leslie, you kind of, um, my question to Leslie was going to be, I think she's already answered it, what do you think history has to offer in a society that is often so focused on moving forward? I guess that's a good one that I can open out to everybody. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, the society's changing, isn't it? And um, uh, yeah, the necessities of history aren't always um, appreciated. Um, so maybe, I don't know, Russell, you could maybe, <laughs> you could maybe talk to that one. Um, yeah, and I was... Just focus it for myself. So I'll read it out again. Um, what do you think history has to offer in a society that is often so focused on moving forward? Sorry, that wasn't really intended. This was correct. So <laughs> yes, that's, that's all right. right. <laughs> but then I had it. Um, yes, I think uh, it's... Um, I get the impression that everyone here would probably agree with the proposition that... Uh, history, and that includes local and regional history, is hugely important to us. And that's not least because uh, here in Aotearoa, we're such a mobile people, you know, socially mobile, maybe less so, but geographically mobile, very much so. And, and of course, as we know, since the 70s and 80s, the pattern of uh, residents around the country, the demography of the different centres, has changed profoundly. Many towns, for instance, in, uh, in Southland, where I grew up, like Fort Rose, are pretty much literally ghost towns now. Uh, in the other places like Charleston on the west coast, that was a ghost town when I was a kid. It's, it was until very recently a tourist mecca, and now it's probably not not so much. And um, with all these changes, we need we need things that kind of bind us together and give us identity. And local history or regional history is a thing that can profoundly do that. You notice the popularity of, if you follow Facebook, which is always a mistake, but if you do follow Facebook, uh, you, you'll know that uh, groups like Old Palmerston North, there's probably an old fielding, I don't know its exact name, uh, of the Old Wellington region, up and down the country, there's these different groups, there's one for Old and the Cargo, which I follow, and it reminds me of things like the Majestic Theatre, when we were going to the pictures as kids. These seem to be so important to people as, as a way of kind of maintaining social cohesion, I think. But not just individual memories, but cohesion. And you notice some of these groups how people actually make contact with one another and start private messaging, personal messaging each other. You know, we were at school with my brother. This, this kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think too that the, the online uh, facility is a bit of a two-edged sword. On the one hand, it's quite wonderful to be able to tap into things like papers past, uh, a wonderful resource. And yet at the same time, one has to be so cautious. I was doing some fact checking, for instance, for an article that we published last year in the Man of Two Journal of History. And it was to do with uh, measures, public health measures that were being instituted in Palmerston North. There was a report in the Man of Two Standard saying that a thing, a rather horrible experience called an inhalation chamber had been installed at the Opera House. Now, I just noticed that the date on that report differed from the official records. And what I discovered was that the newspaper reporter must have reported several days in advance of the chamber actually being installed. The reporter had jumped the gun. And now, it couldn't have been a simple error. And I thought to myself, was the man of the two standard very anxious for the local authorities to get moving and, you know, in the face of this terrible pandemic? And uh, were they, in effect, exerting, trying to exert a kind of pressure on the local authorities by saying the inhalation chamber should have been installed at the Opera House yesterday? So, so that's what they did. Uh, very hard to recover that now. But I, I mentioned that partly as a nice little discovery, but also partly the 
danger of just going with online sources and in effect being a keyboard historian. Because I think what needs to go with that is oral history. All, uh, I mean, aside from using the archives that speaks for itself, and uh, you know, other speakers here have really uh, very ably covered that, the, it's so important to get out and about with local informants. Uh, I can think of a clear instance of that when the man at Te Manawa in Palmerston North was researching a tire hut that had been given to John Tiffin Stewart, who was the original surveyor of much of this area. <coughs> and the tradition in the family was that the tire hut had been presented to him directly by Pati Te Aweo. And uh, so, but the historians who were researching this artifact went out to Rangia too to ask the people there what they thought. And a, a different story emerged very clearly. Taiaha had been commissioned by the Ministry of Works for presentation to Stuart. In other words, the family, family stories are always treacherous, and I would say that of any family, including my own. You know, my sister and brother and I constantly arguing the toss over what happened in the family firm back in the day, and we'll never reach agreement. You know, our, our kids will roll their eyes if they ever read our emails. Um, so, so it's so important to go back to places where the living tradition is maintained, as it is at Rangia too. And it made all the difference to the presentation of the research that that tradition had been taken into account. Uh, in my own case, I was uh, commissioned to write a chapter for the upcoming Palmerston North history to commemorate the Sesky Centennial of Snelson and, and the other entry. Uh, band of uh, very early settlers, Pākehā settlers in the district. Uh, and obviously back in the day, Palmerston North was a railway town. It's a terrible noise from at least 70 trains passing to and fro and shunting, and shunting in the square, etc. <coughs> a lot of that you can find very easily in the documentary record. Uh, council minutes, uh, obviously in the papers passed, uh, engineers' reports, uh, there's just masses of material. But it so happened that I had an uncle who uh, back in the Depression years had been a loco driver in the lower North Island. He'd come up here for work. And the last time I ever saw him, which was on Ratiura, Stuart, Stuart Island, many years ago now, he said to me, oh, you live in Palmerston North, do you? And I said, yes, I did. And he said, they're very house proud people up there. He said, when uh, we would uh, bring the train into town from Longburn, by the, uh, when we approached, um, uh, I think it was Gillespie's line, I think he said, when we approached Gillespie's line, we would put sand in the firebox so that great billows of smoke and soot would, would emerge and, uh, <laughs> and putting soot all over people's washing. And uh, I also had a chance to talk to Adrian Broad, a former Palmerston North City Councillor, about this. And he said, yes, this family had had a house in Main Street West very close to Cook Street. And he said, when somebody went up into the roof cavity once, it was to discover a thick layer of soot over everything, good insulation probably. So I, I just say that as little examples, and in a way surprising little examples of where oral history can take you if you get out and about and chat to people or, where necessary, make a sort of formal consultation. Consultation, we're all archives, we're all making history. And we all need to, as it were, keep the community with each other. So that's not too long. No, I was just thinking of a, a little story that about the oral history. Um, I was in the uh, Chatham Islands a, a few years back, and um, I kept hearing this story of. Um, of I, I kept hearing this amazing story, but it just seemed too good to be true, and I knew I wanted to write this story. And so um, I went on a wild goose chase. I was actually there on a school. I was taking, it was a good school. We were on a school trip. So um, the kids were going off to, um, to visit the local school for a few hours. And I thought, yes, this is my chance to go and find this man because um, he, you know, he was still alive. He was like 99 or something. Um, so I stole a ute um, off. So I asked them, but you know, I. I <laughs> commissioned a youth and I went uh, rocking around the island trying to find this man. Um, so my first stop was the pub um, because I wanted, uh, you know, I just thought the story can't be, I need to hear it from this man because it can't possibly be this good, you know. Um, so I went to the pub 
and they said they sent me off. Like in in hindsight, I said they they were playing with me. They sent me off and said, "Wow, well, please check." And each house I went to, I got yeah. oh no no he'll be you know. But each each house I went to also told me a story. So it was hours long. Um, and then I eventually circled back and I'd given up and I went to the pub. And here he was sitting there. <laughs> so he told me his story and his story was this. So when he was back back in the day. Um, the boat would come over from New Zealand to the channels um, once a year uh, with all the supplies and everything. And um, so he was, um, I can't remember exactly, maybe he was 15, 16, and he was sent down to the boat from by his father to get nails, uh, fencing nails. Um, and he sort of hooked in with the sailors, um, got drunk, and woke up and he was halfway to New Zealand. <laughs> um, so he obviously had to go to New Zealand. He got he uh, got a job as a, in a shearing gang and he actually spent two years in New Zealand. Um, you know, it was his intention to come back, but he, he was having quite a nice time. So he eventually <laughs> came back and, and knocked on his father's door um, with the nails. So, <laughs> so, but that was, you know, I, I and it was as good as it, you know, it was, it, he told me the story from his own with this big jug of beer in front of him. So um, I absolutely do agree that oral history, and, and in his telling, you know, it was just so much better than anybody had told it. Um, and so I think we'll go on to Tina, because she is the absolute treasure for this kind of thing. Um, uh, and just, you know, sometimes when you're, when you um, are, are working on a project or a story or, or you're just, you know, um, investigating your family history or anything, it can be quite dry um, sometimes when you're, when you're going through factual information and, you know, in archives. It can be, um, it can be quite black and white. Um, but maybe, Tina, you can talk to those, you know, those connectors, those emotive things, and, and when you stumble <coughs> upon a, a gem of a story, how you, how you draw that out and how you find the, the human connectors within the history. Yes, that's true. Um, well, um, I guess there's never been a time when I really didn't like research. I mean, even as a child, I always wanted to know everything about everything. So I guess it was logical that I became a journalist. But I really am. I'm always curious. And I love listening to people's stories because every everything is interesting to me. Um, I and, and I grew up in Palmerston. I was born here, went away, came back at seven, and um, and and then left again when I was about nineteen. So um, I can relate now to a lot of things that were happening then. Um, yeah, I remember everything sort of fed into my later life, which was interesting. I remember that. Um, you might, some of you might remember that in Palmerston North, um, at the moment, there's uh, in, um, where is it? Uh, yeah. Not Fitzroy Street, not Smith Street, Featherston Street. There's um, an old people's home called um, Woodlands. I think it's called Woodlands now. And it used to be a very grand house back in the day, um, belonging to the Coombs family. Well. I lived just across the fence from that house when I was seven, eight, nine, ten, growing up. And uh, when we first arrived at that house, I hopped over the fence <laughs> illegally and walked up and down the drive and had a look at this grand house sitting there. It was just in my mind. And at that time, um, a builder, a local builder, had um, he had brought people over from England, um, immigrants, mostly English people, but also some um, of different other nationalities. And they all lived um, in this big house, and he built a block of flats to accommodate even more of them behind this big house. And so I used to go across, um, across over the fence and walk up the, uh, the big drive and look at this house, and there were two huge oak trees in the drive, and lots of blossoming things and, and wonderful natural things there. And um, uh, there were kids everywhere. And so we kids used to go mad. We'd go wild in this blossoming atmosphere with lots of undergrowth and things like that. Maybe wars and in the bush and things like that. And um, uh, then I went, uh, then I left uh, Palmerston North. And coming back much, much later, I was just recently reading the history. I did a story a few years ago in Archer's house, um, which was, it was 
told various things uh, to use the Coombe House. Then it was Hillcrest, and then it was Woodlands, and so on. It's had a long, long history. And I remember the uh, going into the main lobby or the main uh, entrance of the house on the ground floor, and there were, there were steps going up to an amazing large stained glass window and panelling all along the walls of grapes and leaves. And later on, much later, more recently, I discovered that the lady, the original lady of the house, did a lot of that carving herself. And um, so I used to, um, as a child, I used to get up in one of the oak trees in the driveway and read. And the caretaker, whose name was Mr. Christensen, and I, I realize now he's probably one of, a descendant of one of the Scandinavian communities in Palmerston. Uh, he would come up the drive with his two Alsatian dogs, and I creeped and behind the leaves, hoping he wouldn't see me. And sometimes he would, and he'd say, get down from that train. <laughs> and I'd get down and meekly run away. And then when he was gone, I'd go back to him, of course. Um, all these childhood memories um, later on came back to me as I was writing memory lane. And more and more of them, um, it, it was amazing just how much growing up in Palmerston North had affected me and informed me um, as a child. And even as an adult, when I look back, and I can relate certain things to other things now. Um, that was one of my memories. Then I became a reporter for the Manitou Standard at the age of uh, 16 and a half. And um, I was interviewed by Dennis Wederall, who was the assistant editor at the time for the job. And uh, then I wrote a letter to say I got the job. And apparently one of the things that swayed things in my favor was my excellent um, honors record for shorthand. Uh, my exam for shorthand, my commercial exam for shorthand. But the funny thing was, um, I actually hated shorthand and I never did it again once I became a reporter. I invented my own kind of shorthand and I could understand that. And with, with the other kind of shorthand, I figured that nobody else could read it but me anyway. So it was easier to do this kind of part English, part weird Tina shorthand, which worked for me. Um, and we used to do a lot of very dry jobs, like going to the city council and um, listening to a lot of boring speeches, phoning in around the big table upstairs in the square of the building as it is now, which was the council buildings once. And I remember thinking there were a lot of rather naughty young guys who were reporters on staff at the time, and they used to go to endless parties and things. And I was intrigued by the fact that some of them could go to a party on the Saturday or Sunday night or whatever, or even a weeknight, and come back to work in the morning early and be able to go just gaily through the day and do their job without a sign of a headache or anything I thought. And I thought, gosh, that'd be interesting to stay up all night, wouldn't it? You know, and then go to work. I think I'd, I'd experiment with that. <laughs> so one night, I just stayed up all night. I stayed up reading. I didn't go to bed. I got dressed in the morning. I read to work. And I had to go to one of these meetings at the council chambers uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning. I think it was the drainage board. <laughs> and um, the sun was shining through the windows, and it was a very warm morning. And um, anyway, I had my pad and my pencil, and my pen, and I was just sitting there. And suddenly I became aware of a great silence. And I looked up, and I realized I'd actually been asleep on the table. <laughs> And uh, they looked at me very strangely, but um, they were polite enough not to say anything, and we just proceeded on. And I never tried that experiment again. Um, so, so is there anything anybody would like to ask me? Because I could rattle on forever. But, uh, you know, any any specific thing anyone would like to to ask me? When you are doing your um, articles in the in the newspaper. Um, do you actually look back at old newspapers for the ideas, or do you um, get the ideas from somewhere else? Um, a bit of both, really. Sometimes I base a story on a memory that I had or something, and I go back and look and see if it was actually as I remembered it. But other times, yes, I really I, I do a lot of searching through Papers Past. But I was absolutely thrilled when Papers Past became available because it's amazing and you never know what you're going to find. So yes, I, I do, definitely, definitely. Um, one thing I found out recently, I did a story about that for the uh, Dominion Post, was in the 20s and 30s there seemed to be an enormous rash of Missing bridegrooms. Bridegrooms who just turned up on the wedding day. I couldn't figure that out, but there was. Yes, in incredible. And, uh, and really sad for the brides, too. <laughs> I think
think that's the thing that's always struck me with Tina is I'm just always amazed, you know, being a journalist myself, and you know, you've always got to look for story. It's always not just about what you're doing that week, it's about what are you going to do the next week, you know, you've got deadlines and you've got pages to fill in. And Tina just brings the goods every time, it's, it's quite incredible. Um, but we, at what point, um, you know, what, what do you find, Tina? I'm just wondering what that magic is that you, that you think, yep, yeah, I'm going to write about that, you know, that, that there's enough there. Sometimes, you know, you go down a tangent to find, and you research, and you just can't find the human connector. Or, you know, what do you do to, to find that? Because um, they're always sort of people-based, aren't they? You always find people yes. that are involved, and you find some emotive... It's kind of hard to explain, really, because it, it varies so much. I mean, sometimes I'll hear a story a long way ahead, and it'll be done and dusted and, and efficient. And then other times, I'll be looking and looking, and there'll be nothing, and I'll have just a few hours to go, and I, I'll think, this is never going to happen. And then I'll go for a walk or something, or um, I'll watch, turn the TV on, or I'll, I'll look at something online. And then something happens. Um, I'll just get the germ of an idea. It's, it's really strange how that happens, but I think if, if you're always looking and always thinking um, and expecting to find something, you, eventually you will. And I guess with you all, um, maybe you've written books, maybe you've written memoirs, um, you probably know this, that sometimes really oddly, um, you search and search and nothing happens, but if you put it aside for a while and just you know, give your brain a rest, once in a while, um, it just sort of happens on its own. Um, it's almost as if the thing is connecting with you. <laughs> if I can explain it, I can't explain it really, but that's how I feel sometimes, that there's just some little idea that's looking for you and it'll find you. Um, because I know that we have got people in the audience that have you know, written um, their own little histories, um, maybe I could, could search amongst you all and, and you could give me a snippet of um, Val when you were writing your book. You know, it can often, like I was saying, it can often be very black and white. You think, oh, you know, how am I going to put some colour in I here? I actually started off, it was going to be totally like the first book about school experiences and things, and I was going to be totally. I was going to say about me, but it was going to be a to me about swimming in the 1960s and the swimming club and things. I went into the library, said to Louise Lee, what have you got, she gave me this book, I opened it, and it was just like a, a gold mine. I still remember that moment, at least when it was you know, down in the other place. And it was just amazing that all of a sudden I realised that the story was far, far bigger than what I had intended. Um, you know, just, it is, it's the treasures. I was reading a story about somebody who'd written to the mayor and said, um, you know, I was just reading it, it was in the council archives, it was a letter to the editor or something, you know, to the mayor, saying, can you please do something about these people who are, women want to walk along the riverway, and the, these, these men are, I can't remember what the exact story was, yeah, I think obviously the women didn't like the fact that these fellows were swimming in the river with not much on. Nothing and on. as I was, <laughs> Nothing on, actually. <laughs> well, it probably was. And, but as I was walking it, it was a letter to the police, and as I was walking it, two principals mm. walked in, so it was quite fun. But it's just yeah. those little treasures that you don't... I didn't expect to find... That. I went into the library one day with one thought and came out with mm. two or three years' work. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah. where the library is so amazing. Yeah. Our library and our archivists yeah. and librarians. It's just a wonderful place. And it's been my, my problem, Tina, is that every time I think of something to write, you've done eight more minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that was a problem. That's definitely a problem. Oh, Tina. <laughs> um, and maybe, Russell, you could speak to that, and, you know, about the how you inject the colour, you know, um, because you're always wanting to, um, to yeah, put the colour in there, put the voice in there, and the, um, so, so maybe talk to us a little bit about how, how you go about that. Was, as I was saying before, it's partly a matter of talking to people and you know, being curious and inquisitive and nosy the whole time. Actually, when I was a kid, I thought I'd be a newspaper reporter, but we had a next door neighbour who was a newspaper and editor by then, and he said, Don't do it. He said, <laughs> <laughs> and he was actually a, a wonderful journalist, Fred Miller, and, uh, and so he was a wonderful role model, and I think it's something different instead. 
which we'll talk about later. Uh, but, <laughs> but another way of injecting color into it is um, if, you, <laughs> if you go into a physical archive, and here I could perhaps do a fight for the Massey archives because I, I think we're all familiar with the um, field and the uh, Madison North Libraries and the, the, <coughs> the Coach House Museum. But the Massey archive, um, sometimes Massey feels like a sort of dreaded place, and of course it's hard to get parking there and it can put you off. But if you arrange to go to the archive, it's the kind of place where there's a lot of very tactile things. Yes, there's uh, it's admittedly bound copies of minutes of Massey University Council and the academic board and other stuff that would be at least as bad as the drainage board. Right? <laughs> um, there, uh, I would think many sort of shelf kilometers of such stuff. But also there is preserved a lot, lot more sort of tactile stuff. As you go into the lobby of the modest building where the archive is housed, to your right are specimens of butter paper because the archive has uh, collections from most of the little milk companies and creameries back in the day, not, not just right, right around here in the two of and Tikka, but also across the divide into uh, Wairarapa and Tarara Bush districts, including the well known Tui. Not here, but the and uh, so masses of archives so for anyone who's interested in dairy research. That is to say, tactile things like the butter paper, fortunately not the paper that actually is surrounded in butter, but the proofs of how the butter paper would look when the, when the marketing board is assessing different possible papers. Then you go into the, the student uh, the student records part of the archive, they preserve the it's not just masses of sort of enrollment details and printouts and, and other papery sort of stuff, uh, but also bottles of beer, because Massey would have a special, a special beer brew for big occasions, like the Massey rugby team actually triumphed over the other teams in Easter tournament. Uh, and there's a Massey teddy bear for graduates. Uh, so you can put your hand into the, these boxes if you're allowed to handle stuff. And it's that tactile feel that in itself, I think, often can spark a story or set up a string of associations for you. For myself, the very first archival work that I did was uh, many years ago researching an, an English woman who was a prominent scholar on the Vikings, hence my line of interest, uh, but had also been the university administrator, one of the first women to do such a job in, in the United Kingdom. And her records were held at Girton College. And the, there weren't many records because she destroyed most of her papers, but what was left was a shoebox. Literally a shoebox. There must have been for a big set of shoes, a pair of shoes. And in there, it turned out she was a very keen hockey player back in the day. So there was some of her hockey memorabilia uh, in this uh, little badges and ribbons or you know, whatever regalia teams would have back in those days, uh, together with some of her handwritten letters in the most beautiful hand. And that box, just in itself, unlocked a whole lot of this young woman's networking when she was a student at Girton College 130 years ago. Um, through, through the world of hockey and through the world of sort of minor British public schools and so on, you sense that kind of thing touching those uh, the papers and the little ribbons and things far, far more than uh, just reading it off on the screen and it, it really sparks up your own imagination. Um, and it's the connectors as well, isn't it? Um, I did a, a history, well, a history on uh, Bruce Rini, a book on Bruce Rini, um, who was uh, the head of the art department at Rini Tiki for many years, um, and a beautiful artist. And um, so the, this was all really oral history. I just interviewed people, basically. I interviewed about 13 people um, over a couple of months. And, um, and just once you start... Um, you know, listening to the, the stories, you know, you start the stories start repeating themselves between you know people that haven't even met, but the, the stories start to come together. And the one thing that everybody it was it was uncanny. I interviewed probably about thirteen people for the book, and every single person said to me, "There'll never be another Bruce." Every single person said that to me. You know, these beautiful threads and connectors um, that come through. And um, Marilyn and Lisa, you must find that that you you're so. Um, you know, you know, you know the archives. You, you, you know, you're always delving into these histories, and you must come across threads and connectors, and um, and and also, you know, there's there's other layers, aren't there? When I was doing the book, 
um, you know, I was accidentally going down pathways that, um, but you know, somebody would tell me a story about what um, about uh, what it was like to be her student, and so then I'd look at what it was what was happening politically at that time and with education, and I'd accidentally go on this ridiculous tangent of finding out about education in the in the sixties. Um, and you know, you sort of go on these tangents. So you know, what history can contain isn't just the um, what you're searching for. You know, when people come into the archives and they're searching for a particular thing, but accidentally they go off on other tangents of um, social and political and educational and all those sorts of things. So do you find I don't actually know what I'm asking you <laughs> anymore? <laughs> do you find that um, that you you know you come across those things, those connectors and those layers that are um, uh, aren't necessarily what you're looking for? Um, yeah, I. You do, and I think, um, like Marilyn said, you know, we get a lot of inquiries, um, and and despite databases, which are absolutely fantastic for archives because of the way we arrange archives, um, it it make before databases we were very reliant on actually knowing our, our collections really well to be able to assist people. So, um, you know, the old term of being gatekeepers was. You know, even in the best sense, um, we kind of were because there was so much knowledge in your heads, and and I think that still remains. I I think Marilyn would agree with me that you know it takes you years, and I'm still finding out things about our collections, and um, I'm the person who's been there longest in our team. So you know, everyone's evolving their their, their knowledge as well as as they keep going. But <clears throat> I do find sometimes with inquiries, it's um, they don't always go away. Sometimes you're quite satisfied you've, you've done it. You know, you just say, it's really not worth going further. You know, sometimes I, I sound like I'm not caring when someone says, you know, I, I'm still looking for this, that, and next thing. I say, look, there's really no point in going on because it might, but, you know, you could go on forever and still not find anything particular. But on the other hand, you also... You, sometimes things just keep percolating away in your head and to maintain a contact with that person who's asked for something, you know, a day or a week later or sometimes even a month later, you suddenly think, like Tina said, a light bulb moment, you know, something goes on and you say, oh my God, that really fitted what that person wanted. Um, and sometimes you've lost contact with, them, with that person, you think, I can never give that to them now, but I... No, they would have loved it at the time. So I think it's just, yeah, it's just something just throws itself at you or pops up to you or you suddenly think, perhaps I should look further yeah. and, and I can find more. Some, sometimes I've been, I had uh, recently um, some people come in and they have um, moved out of their farmhouse and building next door. And in building, they've come across all these horseshoes. And so they've come up with this theory. What was there? Was it blacksmith? So they sort of come into the archive and say, uh, what was there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes it can be quite unrealistic. <laughs> <laughs> and then like you say, we, we keep a pretty um, close record on them when we have a query. And so like you say, a month later, we're researching here and find something that goes there. So we, we contact that person back and say, hey, look what's just popped up. And I think that's the... Uh, ideal situation of fielding being a small community and, and all the networking that goes on. Mm. Yeah. I, I thought I'd talk yeah. I'm just kind of <laughs> Carl <laughs> said that because I don't know what question I was going to ask you to segue into that. <laughs> this is the Purchase and Settlement of Manchester Rock, which was written by Mr. Gibson in 1936. And he gleaned a lot of information. And then 1974, um, Mr. Davies and Mr. Cleveley uh, were commissioned by the council to write the story. And look at that, pioneering to prosperity. So what I'm saying is, when they wrote this book, they were being paid. So they had to produce it and make it fantastic. Where is Manchester Rock? So you probably all know that uh, Colonel, he's, he was general actually in the end, but when he came out, he was Colonel. Uh, he came out from England, and what happened was it was 
basically a swamp, and within four months there were nearly 300 people here, and all they had was bell tents and some uh, horrors that had been put up with Mamuka brush. And uh, there was no infrastructure, and so it was um, you know, a bit of a... The other book that was, uh, another book that was written was called um, Swamps, Sandflies and Settlers, which more or less highlights what the conditions were when they got here. Anyway, we had got back to um, England, the society that set it up, the um, whole Manchester Fox settlement, and it's got word eventually reached Colonel Field in, in, England, in England, and in consequence, he visited the new settlement in the following year, listened to such complaints as were made to him, but found little area where redress was needed. For the most part, the settlers had become acclimatised and were making personal progress and were loud in their praise. Okay, so that was the um, council <laughs> investigation. Well, I don't know if it was an investigative um, journalist, but the Manchester block, which was put out by the Evening Standard in 1974, which was 100 years later. And this is the first time I came up with, I sort of thought, you know, how can they sort of just glibly brush over this? Colonel Fielding was this journalist, he says, when he wrote, um, Stephen Stewart, with the help of many local residents. Colonel Fielding visited the block in 1876 and found much discontent and unhappiness. He addressed a stormy meeting from the veranda of the corporation's office while his discontented audience stood on Kimbolton Road with mud over their boot tops. So this is just to give you an example of different, like you were saying, you, your brother or your siblings um, disagree with how you perceive something that happened in the family history. Yeah. I love being investigative and, and finding out these. Was that? that um, I might be too much now to know what that, I can find. That reminds me too how, um, amongst all the local historians, archivists, um, librarians, people, everyone who's interested in history, they are so generous. You're all so generous and so sharing and, and just um, so passionate about what you do. And it's just wonderful to connect with you and to just to be given so much great information um, so happily and willingly. Um, it, it's a great thing, really. I, I think you're an amazing bunch of people. Uh, I think it's extraordinary. It's the best, one of the best jobs in the world. Can I ask a question that segues into that, but with, with with archivists in front of me and my friends, if one is doing family research, of course, papers of the past is wonderful. And, but would you recommend actually going to, like in my case, going to Dangerberg, going to talk to the archivists at the library, and to actually going there and talking about some areas that I'm trying to, uh, that I'm trying to find information about this family and all of that? What is it worth actually yeah. I, I staying the night there and doing footwork? Yep. By going to Blenheim um, Brayshaw Park to the archive there. And then they told me to go down to Water Museum and ask to see Jack Taylor because I was going further down the um, island. And they gave me his phone number, so I rang and agreed to meet him. He said to me, oh, look, you're going down to Kaikoura. What you need to do is you need to go and see the um, Trollope family. And when you just get past that, um, those of you who know the Kaikoura coast, there's a lovely church that was a memorial to her son, a lost son. When you get past that, the first driveway on the right, just turn up. I said, I can't do that. <laughs> and um, so he said, he insisted I did, so I went. And here this um, chap had... Uh, the farm settlement was where my uh, whaler had been sent by fax form to the southern boundary. And he said, oh, when I was digging the garden in the 1960s, I came across this um, flagstone. And he said it had four rotten posts in the corners of it. And he said, I've always wondered if that was his um, cow fire. And so then I got on to Kaipora. It, it just, you need to go and wherever your people came from, 
look and find out where the museum is, where the archive is, and go there. And needle in a haystack stuff, but you might be surprised what they've got. And as, as Tina said, there's always in an area, there's always people who are highly passionate, and I'm just sitting here looking at all these people I know here in Rotiori who are highly passionate about um, sharing that knowledge. Only too willing, most people. Yeah, it's always amazing when you when you do go on a, I love a wild goose chase, <laughs> when you go and you know one person says go knock on that door and you do and you get sent over here and and um, in some of it you might not be gaining the information that you need but you get some bloody good yarns along the way, <laughs> like it's worth it just for the yarns, mm -hmm. hey Tina. <laughs> yeah, I guess you look so somebody in a certain uh, time frame like the 1870s or the 1890s or the 1920s and you're getting a sense of that social history like you were saying all these bridegrooms who disappeared in the 1920s and like why yes yeah i think i do think comment that i can did i get you to say we were all going i'm on the committee of all the bill rail stations we have a checklist yes, <laughs> okay. <Okay. Yes. laughs> yes I, I, I think sometimes that um any sort of historical um, research that you do, you're, you're often going to get just little snippets here and there, and some of them won't even necessarily be very factual. But you know, when you gain all those little pieces, when you actually look back what you've got, you actually do have the frame of a story. You might not have very specific details for your family even, but just to set it in context mm -hmm. and to put it in a place and to see perhaps what other people were doing at that time, even though it's not your family, it, it does give you um, a sense well, of your family see what as well. Mean, like, try and win the sawmills, sawmill yeah. everywhere. Yeah. And, and, and the sawmill owners were wealthy, and of course the sawmills have all gone now. Yeah. But, so I, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> Can I just say something, please? I, I see I have two things I want to say. But the first one is that when you're interviewing somebody, often you get people who go along with a list of prepared questions. They stick religiously to those questions. But sometimes the most important and interesting things come from the little sides. I remember once I had a, a boyhood hero. I read all, everything about him, all that sort of stuff. Douglas Bader, the, the legalist fighter pilot from World War II. And he came to Wellington, and uh, I was working for the Dominion, I think, at the time. And I was sent along to interview him. And uh, because of the tight time schedule, I stacked a whole series of interviews, one after the other. And I had to sit in this hotel waiting for my turn. And the guy before me was um, a fellow from this brand new thing called TV New Zealand. And all their reporters used to dress in face clothes and sort of put on airs. And uh, he goes up to Douglas Barter for his turn. And he said, uh, <clears throat> tell me, Mr. Barter, when did you first, lose, when did you actually lose your legs? And he said, 1931. Then the guy said, oh, then you didn't fly in the war then. And I thought, man, what's going to happen here? And here's a fellow who was an ex-boxer, who was very fiery and pugnacious. He's going to blow up at the surely. He said, well, yes, I did, actually. And it was very quiet and very soft. And I saw another side of him completely in that moment. That was really interesting. And often you'll find that little things come in between the questions that will take you off somewhere else or will show you an insight into the character of that person. Now, so far as another person in this room is concerned, I think she's probably too modest to say it herself, so I will. Um, and that is that uh, this carries on with the question about technology and uh, all the things we can use today to help us and all that sort of stuff. Well, the newspaper owners in the country got this bright idea one time to listen to the blandishments of an American company and surrender all their photographs and negatives uh, to this central place that was going to digitize them and send them back. And so they got rid of a lot of their um, pictures, their photographs, and their, and their negatives, sent them away, and this company went bust, and eventually the, the material was sold elsewhere. Well, Tina used to not, well, slow down there. She used to sneak stuff out of the office <laughs> library over to the archives to get digitized and copied beforehand. 
and eventually they set up a deal where the, a lot of the records were taken to uh, to the archives instead. And as it happened, the matter of a few standard now is one of the few countries, one of the country's few newspapers who actually has their own heritage in the terms of photographs and photographic films. An important thing too was when the Thomas Mills Library got their hands on the negatives, they found that a lot of them had a strong vinegar smell, which meant that they were starting to deteriorate. And so if they'd waited much longer, they would have lost them that way too. But um, these things can be preserved. There's treasures everywhere. There really is treasures everywhere. And that's an, an important thing. I feel quite proud of it today. Well, I'm also her publisher the agent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't quite that dramatic. Oh, come on, it's a good yes, story. It's a good story. I have to take right? tribute, really, to Kevin Glasgow and um, our local uh, archives, because uh, library archives, because, uh, yeah, they, they actually took those photos which could have, in another few years, completely disintegrated those, those um, uh, copies. And um, now they're safe. They're over here, they're being stored, they're, they're in the proper pool room where they should be. They're going to last for a long, long, long time. And uh, Lisa, you might like to. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're just a fascinating collection. And in, in fact, I have to honestly say that Ian Matheson started the conversation with the Manawatu Standard about photographs long before my time. And there was, uh, you know, and over the years I had a couple of conversations as well, and we were very concerned when we, they were going to the United States. Fortunately, um, they only sent the photographs and, and um, everything fell to bits quickly enough that they, the whole collection didn't go. But um, that's just the most wonderful collection, and we're digitising those um, and on Manawatu Heritage. But, um, you know, that's, that's as good a history of your, your town as anything, your newspaper photographs. I mean, they only started a period of time because they were definitely mainly only syndicated photos, um, particularly for the Manawatu standard until about the mid-50s. So they, I'm, I make an assumption that that's when they actually uh, hired a photographer and took their own photographs. That's when the collection basically starts, right. mid-1950s. Um, the Manawatu, the Times actually had their own photographs a lot earlier than that. But um, I don't know, but I don't know where that collection went, unfortunately. <laughs> but those, those are wonderful. And as we get them digitised, because they're just, they're just boxes and boxes of thousands of negatives. So you really don't know what they are. And they'll say something like rugby on Saturday or, um, you know, occasionally it's something, you know, Mr. Dykes visits town, you know, which might help you a little bit more and it'll have a date on it. Um, but they're virtually, they're pretty inaccessible until you get them digitised. Um, and they're going up all the time on one or two heritage. We're lucky we've got a good digitisation budget. And they're, they're good quality, excellent photographs. And, and fortunately, Fairfax has learned that they are not going to make millions out of selling their images, their, you know, their local images. Because I think that that was all the idea, was that there was actually some financial gain in the collection. Um, but, something like that. but there isn't, and now that actually they're very obliging and, and give people access very easily. We still have to work through Fairfax when we um, pass on, you know, high resolution um, images. But um, but yeah, they're, they're a great collection. We're up to about the only the sixties um, on Manawatu Heritage. Uh, but yeah, just just a fantastic, you know. Like the first day of school, there's always children, you know, there's always some school being photographed or um, just, uh, yeah, wonderful treasure in, in those um, photos. Another resource that I've always um, gone to as well is um, Nga Tonga, the Sound and Vision yeah. mm -hmm. in Wellington. That's an amazing, underrated amazing, actually, amazing um, resource. resource. Yeah. Um, you know, for, for me, um, when, when we sort of moved into the realm of doing Fairfax always wanted a video to go with every story. Um, and if I was doing some sort of a historical narrative, I'd you know, go and get some sound bites. Or, and they were always just so amazing. You know, you'd bring through and, and say what you needed and you get there and everything. They just loved helping you. Um, and you'd have your own booth. And some of, the, some of the things that they hold in that collection are just oh. incredible because they're, they're putting a, a, um, you know, a soundtrack to, to, to the history as well. 
um, like I was thinking of with your with the railway, with the trains coming through, you know, uh, just just adding that if I was to write that story, you know, you, or if I was to make a video on that, you just want that sound of the trains rattling through coming. Um, you know, they, they hold those kind of archives and that's really amazing. Move, what did you want to say? <laughs> He's going to point a stick at me in a minute. No, 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 no. There's, there's so many things I want to say. <laughs> But, I, uh, I must say, too, uh, Move's an amazing interview. If you even need to interview somebody, interview Move. He's very well, entertaining. Well, it's awkward getting, getting people asking you questions when you've brought up all your life to ask them yourself. But anyway, I'm just I'm saying... I'm sure that, you'll manage Move. Well, yeah. <laughs> the idea about the standard Tony photographs in the oh, 50s was because yeah. one day the editor who resisted hiring a photographer went down to Wellington on a junket, on a junket and while he was away, the staff hired a photographer. <laughs> and when he came back, it was a fait accompli, and uh, he wasn't too happy about it, but eventually they hired another one, and they're away, they joined the 20th century. Yeah. Yes, one, one photographer who can remember the early days, the early 60s, and everything, is Morris Costello, who's still around, and he's young. It could be a great interview subject, I think, for our young people. It certainly means that there's some depth. This year we were just finishing uh, doing the editing on an article that involved, among other things, milk in schools, as introduced by Dr. Elizabeth Gunn in this region. And a thing that we couldn't find from the time of the original introduction was any kind of photo of kids at uh, College Street School as a target school, because I think they were the pioneers in this. What we obviously wanted was a picture of children in the classroom with these little bottles of milk open and uh, sucking uh, milk out of them. And there just wasn't one. In the end, we had to settle for a photo, for a photo from much later. I think from memory, maybe from the 1950s, 20, really 20 years after the introduction. And that's probably down to what you're saying, that they just weren't photographers with the local papers. And I understand that the Manor Two Times collection has been lost. But it's a bit of a mystery where it went, but it's, it's most unlikely to turn up now. I don't know if anyone knows yeah. more about that. It was um the Times was actually bought by the Dominion and closed down. So I have I have wondered whether the Dominion had any sort of insight that they actually did take it to Wellington, but I've never heard that they have, and whether it just became part of the Dominion um, collection of photographs. But I've never heard that that was the case. They just may have just disappeared. And you've never run across the Digitizers that didn't run across any specific natives that were somehow no. obvious in times. Uh, and unfortunately, not in the standard program. Yeah. No, no. The matter of two times was doing extremely well, and they made a technical error, and that was going down to Wellington and selling the Palmer's North newspaper on the Wellington railway platforms. And that got up the Dominion's nose. Also, they went into the Hawke's Bay and started selling there, and they got up more noses. And eventually there was a hostile takeover. And I spoke to the editor um, afterwards, and he said that uh, he was in his office working on the Friday night at about 7.30, just finishing off the paper, and the heavies moved in and said, OK, midnight, all the doors are shut, the locks are changed, they're all out, gone. And uh, so the uh, work in the actually killed what was then Palmerston North Coast newspaper. What year was that? 1964. I guess it goes back to the time when um, newspapers were privately owned by families mm -hmm. in many ways too. But researching my book, Kaikoura Star doesn't exist anymore and um, nobody, it was all just destroyed. But luckily, my family who were still there pulled the oak, cut the oak bits out for family members, so that's a bit of a help. But um, the Fielding um, Herald its uh, office was, um, oh, they were doing some. Um, not exactly, but just some tidying up, I think is what they said. And uh, we got phoned at the archive on Tuesday afternoon and told that all the Fielding Herald photograph collection and the newspapers um, were there if we would like to come and collect them. Otherwise, if we hadn't picked them up by Friday, they'd be destroyed. So, <laughs> three car loads in my station wagon. <laughs> and um, what's happened now at the library, we've we spent three years just sorting. They've just basically opened the drawers and threw the photographs into cardboard boxes, and that's how they came to us. So we just spent three years sorting them into some sort of order. 
and now the library's come and I see the um, digitalization program here. Yeah, it will be um, that might to um, help digitize something. Yay, so it's going to help with that. <coughs> Anyone who's doing family history, just to name another example, anyone who's doing family history in South Taranaki may already know that the newspapers from Hara and Elton had never been digitalised. And if, uh, I don't personally have family from there, but if I did, I'd be worried. And uh, I think with papers like regional papers like that of great significance, you know, flourishing areas back in the day and still to an extent today. Uh, there needs to be all encouragement for those folk and, and maybe lobbying for funding to have those papers digitalised. Because at the moment, I, I don't even know how it's safely be preserved and conserved. Um, yes, I mean, in theory, the National Library does have copies, which at least, even if they're not digitised on papers past, that there should be copies, hopefully, um, even if they're just on film. So, um, so that, that is a that's a start. I mean, the there is a um, papers pass working in collaboration with libraries. I mean, we're lucky because we're a larger organisation, so we have budgets for things like that. But um, uh, we actually we were one of the first that worked in collaboration to get our newspapers on. Some that there, there were other newspapers on much prior to us, but we said um, we inquired about can we get the one or two standard on, and they said. Um, Oh, well, you know, yes, at some stage, probably, but you're on the list somewhere, we'll get to you. And we said, well, can we contribute? Can we help out? So um, that was a really good move. And now that's that's the, the way they do a lot of the collections, is that, um, is that they work in collaboration with people who actually do have some funds to get it done. It, because it's an expensive business, you know, if we look over the years. We're up to 1945 now. And... Um, I wouldn't like to tell you how, how much money has gone gone into it, and that's only half shares. Um, no, we're we're not going to 1950 until um, the Domin uh, the Dominion Post I think goes to 50, but we only go to 45. <coughs> yeah. Um, another, just thinking of another um, uh, place that um, that I there's a treasure trove that not many people often think of is the Tamanawa back rooms. Uh, if you've ever been oh, yeah. back there, is is quite extraordinary. The back of Tamanawa is like a rabbit warren of rooms, and it's very easy to get lost. Corridors, and even the corridors are chock a block with with just with old books and things that you know. I think they don't quite know what to do with. But there is. Um, and Cindy Lilburn um, is the, I don't know what her official role is, but, the, but I think of her as the, the goddess of the back group. <laughs> That's her official role. Yeah, great. Yeah. 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 But it is, um, um, you know, it's an amazing uh, tre treasure trove. If you're researching something and you just want a tangible item, um, you know, there's, there's incredible uh, all sorts, everything imaginable in those back rooms. It's quite incredible. So it's another. Um, a resource, um, you know, if you want a tangible item to look at. Yeah, she's manager of the history collections. That's it. She's not, but she's also the goddess of yeah. the back room. <laughs> <laughs> Quite yeah, because I, I think that when you are, um, you're researching a, an area that you're not actually currently living in, to actually find those primary resources can sometimes be a challenge as well because you know archives aren't always kept in the same place you know they might be in a library they might be in a museum they might be in a voluntary organization that's set themselves up um, they could be with an historical group um, so you know that's usually where you need local knowledge to say well where do you keep your information and of course it's not all online because if you're talking you know small community groups um, sometimes they don't have that facility um, or ability to uh, to make give themselves an online presence so that's usually local knowledge that will tell you where things can be Easy, I found that you just need to ask one question. I was following up in Wairau some stuff about my father, and I wanted to know if ever you go through Wairau, it's the most amazing little museum. And I wandered in and spoke to a volunteer, and she had me connected with the archivist within about five minutes. Yes, that's right. Well, those small town museums are absolute gems. Yeah, well, I wasn't expecting it to blow <laughs> your way. Yeah. yeah. 
But one thing, if you are going to another area to re do research, then plan ahead. Because well, this was saying, just a casual passing through. Yes, I said, I'll show my you were husband. lucky. I'll show my husband, husband, you know, where my dad grew up. Sort of thing. Yeah. But a lot of these places are, have specific hours when they're open and in a specific day. So you do really need to plan ahead of your journey. Yes, and, and you know, we do get people who, who come in and they want something and you say, well, we can't do that today. Oh, I'm only here for this afternoon. And, yeah. and they live in England or something. <laughs> and, and, and I think often, you're quite right, it's because it's unexpected. They say, I'm here, I might as well ask. Yeah. And when there is actually something there and you say, we can give you this, these five boxes, you know, they say, well, I've only got an hour. <laughs> and and it, it, yeah, I, I think it's because it's unexpected and, and you do get that drop-in query. So further to that, I, when we were living in Canada, I had a friend who ran an archive for genealogical research and they had an open day and, and a guy came and he was actually a, a policeman, a Mountie. And uh, he'd been, he made, he said he'd made two trips to Scotland to try and track down his ancestry. And she said, give me a moment. It took her 10 minutes and she found it. The guy almost passed out. But I, he, I wrote a story about it saying, Mountie finds got his man, finally. <laughs> so, um, sort of uh, right at his doorstep. 10 minutes it took to find. And he made two fruitless trips to Scotland. Wow. From Vancouver. Then again, you don't know what you don't know. No, so, but it, you it, know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. hard to know whether it, he had done the right thing or the wrong thing. You yeah. don't know those. Um, one thing that I want, I'll, I'll open it up to questions, but my, just for my own personal um, thing, the question I really wanted to ask everybody, and that Merv sort of um, reminded me, was when you're writing, um, you know, a, a, a history, a family history, or whatever, and uh, we were talking about, you know, you get the facts, and and sometimes, you know, you. You, you make the connections, um, and they might not be completely and utterly uh, based on fact, but you, you've done your research and you've got the feeling of what's happened. Can you, how, how much liberty do you have to to, uh, to, to write that? Um, you know, Tina, when you would come across this, where you, you just need one connecting fact, and it will bring it all together, and you don't, you don't necessarily find that connecting fact, but you find something pretty damn similar. Do you do you round out that narrative story with your own not embellishment, but do you put pieces together and, um, and, and interpret? Oh, very much. Um, you know, there's always things that people don't understand. Uh, I can think in my own family history. Fairly recently, I heard a story, uh, but not many people wanted to see it, and uh, I found it quite funny. But Sad, but, and that was that uh, I have come from Irish um, ancestors and relatives. And back in the early 1900s, um, one of the daughters was married to this guy, and uh, things were going on fairly well. And then um, he met another girl with whom he was having an affair. Well, the mother of the bride, uh, the original bride, was so incensed that she wouldn't let the, the, the husband near his wife again. And whenever he would come around, that the story goes, she would lock the, the wife, the young wife, into the hen house so he couldn't get at her and she couldn't get at it and then he had to go away. <laughs> I mean, it's funny little things like that that make me laugh, but you know, they were pretty serious and awful at the time. Uh, there's so much like that out there. Everybody has some little kind of snippet of something like that. Um, are there any questions from the, from the floor? Where else and what, what my experience, I'm actually a Hutt Valley girl. Um, my family came out in 1841 on one side, 1853 on the other. So, you know, I'm, I'm really a Hutt Valley girl. Yeah. I've been here for two years, but I've just, um, at the beginning of lockdown, bought a house in Shamrock Street in Palmer School. It's 1926, beautiful, lots of original stuff, um, bungalow. And I've just had this idea of a lockdown and I kind of like to, I've, I've done a lot of family genealogy and you know, history and stuff like that, but um, I'd like to do. The history of my house, you know, going right back and, and see if I can find people who lived in the house over the years or, you know, memories of visiting 
grandparent there, just it just and publish <coughs> in my house just for me, um, just because I, I love all of that kind of stuff. But also just to keep working out for my cellar, just as a you know, with old pictures and you know, can obviously see where walls have been taken out, what walls are different, and there's you know, these interesting things apart from library archives, the council, and like you say, those back rooms that you know, because I'm not a local. Any other suggestions of where I could look for photos or any anything? I mean, it's it's always worth looking on Digital New Zealand, which is a, a, you know they harvest digital libraries around New Zealand. So sometimes when I'm looking for a photo that I know we don't hold ourselves, I'll go and search on Digital New Zealand because it may have ended up at the National Library. <coughs> may have ended up somewhere else and if it's been harvested into there so that's definitely always worth a search um, because that can often provide something from other places. Town planning and infrastructure kind of stuff around on Spets and Taco that would be through council wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. It's, I mean I, I think um, you might be able to agree or perhaps not agree Marilyn with me um, people that's a relatively common query as people come in yeah. and, and they I had love when you say photo with people on the veranda but <laughs> no, I kind of want to go a bit, a bit beyond yeah. that yeah. I like like you're saying that the, the, the funny things that happen in the house the, 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 the quirks of the people yeah. you know why they live here what do they love about it what are they to test about the house you know I want the stories um, um, do you yeah, know I, I do think that Yes. No, I, I literally, I actually bought the house and it was settled the day we were before lockdown, so it's been empty for seven weeks before I can move on. But I do just really do. Um, um, if, if you know, really, really it, it's a great question, and people do think that councils have extraordinary amount of information yeah. about their they house. Don't, I know people don't have the information, but they, are the same, um, they really only have the information where, where something about the house intersects with the council. But they would have, like, obviously, the same resource. So you. Um, well, you know, once again, and it's what's survived. So, you know, you, you will get snippets. And That's always a thing. Lots of people find names of the title and things like that. You know. Have you looked in the attic? In the um, well, I'm actually quite just at the moment the way oh, that I'm placing it. <laughs> so, um, um, yeah, I have a ladder. If someone would like to come to my house and get up on the ladder, get up on my yeah. ceiling, I would just, love it. There's two things, you know, people go to Maryland, yeah. uh, based on business diaries, and the basement of the house, and the history of the thing. And then I remember in my own student flatting days, we were living in a rather large house in Pride Street in Dunedin, and got nosy about the house, and somehow got up into the roof cavity. And lo and behold, it was a set of diapers from probably, it was from the 1960s, then probably from the 1930s. They were actually written by someone who at the time was a prominent public servant in the 1960s, that had been a school board in the 1930s, with stories about the house and a trip to Christchurch, where he had pies and honorary. Timberu and Bashford and he was clearly a lover of pies. <laughs> all this vivid stuff just up there in the attic. But, I mean, my childhood house we dug up to the front of the garage in and found a silver teaspoon and we still got it. I wish you put the house, but it's in lower heart and it's got a sil proper silver, um, she feels silver, and it's got an E just engraved on the, like it's always getting into the that mesh of hair there, don't they? Yeah. You know, and this was just found, you know, underneath the house when, when the digger came in to, to get the Come tomorrow night, 7 30 here, in the local genealogy group that have been up there. They will give you lots of clues. You must know the original builder owner of the house. So they will give you lots of clues how to find out. I mean, on the street, this has been thinking out of the box. Yeah. Um, with the human connector stuff, yeah. is there uh, other little houses on the street that are a similar age? You There's a lot. lots of doors. Are there some oldies yeah. on your street? Um, you like, know, because I, I can't really walk, I haven't done much yeah. hobbling up and down the um, like we, we bought this old cottage in Malta years ago, and um, it was, um, I didn't know anything about it. Um, and the next door neighbour, um, Hazel. Um, and Al, they, they knew, um, so it was Reuben McGee's cottage, and we found out it's amazing history, and they just, and then I connect, so from that 
uh, IT start with yakking to people, yeah, then, yeah. then yeah. go and, and yeah. look in the books and yeah. there's Ruby and connect all, and it's an amazing thing. <coughs> um, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, elderly are an amazing resource for, uh, for kicking off that search. I'm just finished doing oh, my, my grand doors. Doors. Just finished doing a video and I'm looking at all history. Yeah, and she's going for his rapid onset of dementia. Yeah. So we decided, my mother and I were talking about three years ago, that we better get in there and get her stories. And, yeah, often you can. I a lot of libraries will still hold all copies of a publication called Wives Have Died. Yeah, and they list the occupants of the house at a specific time. So you can look up your house and see who was living at 29 Jones Street in 1944 or 19 whatever. Now, some libraries still hold those and they're really good. Um, also, old electoral rolls are too. We can say, see, Tina's father vanished. She didn't see him for 26 years. We tracked him down. <laughs> you know, we tracked him down. It was basically done through electoral rolls. And it ended up, I knew, I found out, she let a remark slip one day that he could the ward and be the part of. I knew that. But she told me he was not a conscript, that he had enlisted. I said, right. And he's got a pension. So I, I, I got in touch with the, the uh, defense forces, and they ended up referring me right up to the big man, right at the top. And he wrote, wrote me a letter back saying we have no information. I wrote him back another letter and said, rubbish. If he's alive, you're paying him a pension. If he's dead, you're not. Which is it? And he, he wrote me back another letter and said, <coughs> we've passed your uh, 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 request on to last note address, you know, and within two days we had a phone call from her dad. And so you can go through electoral rolls and find out who was living in a particular place at a different time or where they are. Um, it was a long story, it took us quite a, quite a while because we just did it on and off. Uh, you know, I think Massey University has rises and um, electrical roles way back. I think so. See that one that was old and you can go on. Yeah, I was going to say just like it's a time to one. Well, that's a wrap, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you for having me.
That's my busiest day of the week, but that's okay. So now I'm late on. So I found the mention there. Um, 
No, no, I won't like this. And then I subsequently take that idea and it would be a very Writer, a guitar, living in Lower Hutt, 
um, and the author of um, From a Shadow Grave, uh, which won this year's Sir Julius Vogel Award for Best Novella Novelist. Um, the no novella uses a historical murder as a teaching point, using narratives of multiple possible futures, deploying urban fantasy, historical fiction, time travel, and more. Sounds cool, <laughs> Uh, next, I've got um, Christina Saunders. Sanders. Sanders, sorry. Um, she's a confirmed bookworm, um, having spent her childhood in her family's Wellington bookshop. Um, her young adult manuscript displaced was inspired by her family's immigration from Norway in the 1870s. It won a 2020 storyline's Tessa Dugger as a young Duggar. That's the next one. Yeah, yeah Junior is a first novel for adults and it too draws on history as Tug Wellington's colonial beginnings. I very much push that into one sentence. It's way more than that. Um, Tan next, I've got. I've got Kirsty Powell. Kirsty makes um, real New Zealand characters in her fiction. Uh, poems and short stories. She has a master's of creative writing and released her debut novel, The Street in the Shell. She is currently working on a sequel novel <coughs> and a chapter book for children. Tiny, tiny, what have I written about Tiny? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, tiny Chappelle has published a book of short stories, which I was one of my favorites. I, I love that book. Um, I keep going back to it. And a sequence of four novels that trace the fortunes of a family in mid Victorian Gloucestershire and some of the descendants who migrate to New Zealand and the Pacific Islands. Again, I've condensed that into an extremely brief sentence. Um, the final novel in the series brings the story up to the present day. Um, so they're quite the march through history. Jill, 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 what have I written about you? <laughs> um, Jill Dara has um, done heaps for the arts. Um, within the community. Um, for the last seven years, she's been running her own publishing business, Reading Power and Publishing. Um, more than 70 books, uh, representing over 200 New Zealand authors, have been born under her watch. Um, she's written five of her own novels, two novellas, a collection of articles from one or two standard, and two plays, which have been in the theatre. Um, so yeah, as you can see, we've got some pretty cool cats in front of us. Um, so yeah, title plunderers of history. 